Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I don't know of any other, like, you know, geology type surveys that could be done that could find them. I'm a biologist, like I said, not a geologist. So I don't know specific rocks that they could be looking for that could potentially lead to caves or, or mines or something. But, you know, just, ha just talking to local landowners, and if they, they usually know their land better than just about anybody, and if they know of a, a hole in the ground that could lead to an underground cave system that, you know, houses. You know, and it doesn't have to be a huge cave. It can, it can be just a small opening into the ground, and then it houses, you know, 100 bats or so, or not even that many, and that's good enough. So, but yeah, you could do that whole big survey of tracking, and it could lead you to a cave of of 12 bats or something, and then you're you spend all that money to find 12 bats. You know, so it's a lot of variables and a lot of money and man hours for potentially nothing gained. So, yes, sir. Um, not that I know of. I think it's it's mainly a, uh, like because bats are hibernating there, so they're just sitting there, letting you know the fungus come over them. Other animals are are pretty active in in those caves. If it's like a, a raccoon or a skunk or something walking through there, they might get the spores, but then they're off and and it's not really spreading because the the climates once they leave the cave are not uh, conducive to the fungus growing more. So if they live in the cave and stay in there and don't really leave, and all they're doing is eating bats, then I could see them getting affected by it but no and it doesn't affect humans at all like I, I work with them and I don't you know I obviously I shower and decon myself and everything but uh, there's no there's no fear of I'm going to spread white nose to my kids or something like that yes sir I have no need you're, you're good yes sir yes sir For the white nose, that's that's the important stuff. So, so these hard dates on that August 15th date that have to be moved back some because of their 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 and so they're not they're not even going even in August I wouldn't I wouldn't expect to find bats anywhere near their cave so the the August 15th is more just for that maternity season when the when the females are giving birth and when they're susceptible to damage and so a lot of times like why they have these guidelines is so if I have a, a wind project and they're looking to build uh, wind turbines in the area we go out and we survey during the summer to tell if you know, if you have roost trees here, it's best not to to build during this time, during May 15th to August 15th, because you have a roost tree here. Or on a pipeline survey, hey, you've got a slew of, of roost trees right here. You need to reroute and change your plan on where you're going to just cut a line in the in the forest. So that's more what it's for. It's the 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 big picture is yeah, it's it's the hibernacular stuff and white nose, but we can't the projects that we work on, they can't really they don't really have any measure on that. I mean, academically, that's where the that's where it's great and that's where a lot of the you know, university stuff comes in, but for like me, I'm a consultant. Um, that's there's not really any money in there. <laughs> so, for when like energy projects and wind energy and 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 oil and stuff like that and other construction projects are going on in forests, that's where we come in because the habitat loss is still is still a major part of it because you don't want to be actively cutting down and adding to the already strain from white nose. But for academics, that's where I, I know a lot of students that have gone to grad school. And, and since I left, White Nose was just starting when I was in grad school, and I didn't, we didn't have any worries. You know, I was barehanded out there with the with the bats, and you know, touching them all and letting them bite me and everything, and not not worrying about decon and stuff. But now I see my friends and colleagues out there, and they're in full almost hazmat suits, you know, going into the caves and stuff. And yeah, it's pretty intense. So um, it's grown a lot, but. But like I said, the the where I where I focus in and where a lot of studies focus in for for energy and stuff is during the summer. But uh, universities and academic stuff is is really starting to move towards towards white nose, and I know a lot of people that are doing that actively. Yes, sir.
Uh, I, have, I have no idea. <laughs> How are the bats doing in, in St. Paul, Minneapolis, compared to up here? Right, yeah, I don't, I don't think that there, it's been confirmed at all in any of those caves down there. It's only been confirmed in here. I guarantee you there will be, if there's known caves and, and mines and stuff in the area, those will be surveyed. Uh, if they have, like, active bats in there, if they're just caves that no bats are in, then, you know, just because it's a cave doesn't mean a bat's going to go there. It doesn't necessarily, like, putting up a bat house doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a bat living in the bat house. Uh, just because it's a cave doesn't mean there's going to be bats there. So they'll go in and survey them and find, you know, the relative health of it, but... Otherwise, I, I mean, I think they're fine. I don't, I don't know about any of the caves in, in uh, St. Paul or Minneapolis. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, that occurs all, all, all over the northeast and kind of really just the eastern part of the, of the country and then kind of peters out uh, in northern North Dakota and then up into Canada, but they don't really get further west. So, um, but those numbers in in Minnesota right now are looking good because the white nose isn't affecting them and you know the distance that they're traveling for hibernacula isn't uh, they're not traveling from New York to Minnesota to come to their to come to their foraging ground so um, how about bear right no no I haven't no no I haven't and and usually, like, the, the caves that the bats are in or, or, you know, that I've seen are a little bit bigger, and, and bears like to be kind of tucked into to tighter places. But, no, I haven't, I haven't read any reports or anything of bears getting it in there. And bears, the, the thing about, you know, people say that bears hibernate. It's not actually hibernation because they are such big animals. If they were in full hibernation where they shut down like bats do, anything like a weasel or, or any, like a mouse could come in and just chew on the bear for hours and be full and the bear would take hours to wake up and attack it. But if you were to go into a hibernating bear's den, it would rip your face off pretty quick, you know? Whereas bats are almost completely shut down and so the, the fungus can sit there and work on them and they don't actively, you know, it's not actively waking them up until it's almost too late. And bears, you know, once they start to decrease their, their food stores, they're gonna wake up pretty quick. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, we're just doing. We're, we've got some projects coming through the area, and uh, just some some surveys and getting some census of the area. So. You mentioned the bathhouses. Is there any artificial hibernaculums that are being used for that purpose? Or I, I don't know how you would reproduce the. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like a like a, a man-made cave or something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there is. There is actually. Uh, is there any man-made caves or artificial? A hibernaculum. Yeah, there is. It's it's really expensive to do because it's uh it's it has to be the perfect temperature and it has to be the right thing. And a, a lot like bat houses, it has to uh, to build you know a large thing that takes years for them to come. But there has been a there was a company down in I believe it was Texas where they or maybe New Mexico where they built something and you had, they had windows on the sides that we could see and try to try to study their habitat. But it's it's really rare because they you know like those bats that. Um, Cluster in the the hundreds of thousands. That's a lot harder to get them to just move to a new place. And I've been in caves where you know, almost as tall as me, the guano levels are that high because they've been coming there for almost tens of thousands of years and roosting in the same spot and pooping in the same spot. So, I don't think I've got too much more here. Basically, let's end with some positivity, I guess. <laughs> right now, in 2014, from what I can tell you just of this, of what we're doing out here, the bats are healthy. There's, I haven't seen any signs of white nose on any of the bats out here. Uh, they are abundant. I've, we have been catching all the species that we have thought we would be catching. Uh, your forest management has been effective. It's, it's been, we've got found healthy roosts, and like I said, we've got a roost of 53 the other night, and that's a really, that's a really good roost, and so it's been, it's been working. That, that part of it is working. The white nose is the problem, and I'm gonna just stay positive. Um, healthy bat habitat is healthy habitat for many other plants and animals. Because they cover such large areas, and they, you know, they forage, they roost, uh, it's such a large patch of habitat, uh, it's, Conserving habitat for bats is conserving habitat for deer and, you know, 
salamanders and, and all types of and plants and animals and just the forest health in general and birds and all that. I always forget about birds, but um, yeah. Bats love Aiken County. There we go. There you go. Yep. And that's that. Thank you. Um, has, is pesticide affecting bats or anything? Uh, not that I've not that I've ever been aware of. I mean, it. I think it, you know, lowers their numbers. But there is so many bugs and so many other moths and stuff that aren't necessarily pests on 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 crops and stuff. Like maybe they'll they'll focus on some of the beetles that are pests of of, of crops and stuff. But there's so many other different types of of insects out there that have nothing to do with corn or soy or any of the other crops. So that I don't think I've ever come across that as being a, being an issue. I have when I was when I was very young. I was very young. Uh, they, 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 I think they tend to fly like that because I think it's a predatory thing. So it's kind of like birds of a feather. You know, they kind of just move and migrate together. I think that, you know, birds or, or bats, when they're massed like that, it's just a, a massive number. And because there is like hawks and stuff that will, that will eat them and everything. And so if they're all, yeah, if they're all together like that, and, and it's crazy, we've, we do radar studies as well. And what we'll do with that is uh, it's basically like meteorological equipment and we can see bats flying over and it's like a cloud and they're just migrating together so it's kind of just a, a, a numbers thing like keeping numbers going and helps with predation but predators aren't really an issue with bats I mean excuse me uh, there is predators of bats but it's not a, uh, a widespread thing that it's ever like detrimental to a population um, I've seen snakes on the on the side of a cave as bats are leaving and it's just trying really hard to catch them but bats are very good at flying like I said and it's very hard to catch them and that's why they hang upside down because raccoons and stuff can't actively f crawl up there but in trees sometimes you know sometimes I'll I, one time I did track a bat to a tree and I counted a bunch of bats and then the next day I went there and the transmitter was still there but there was no bats and there was a snake in there, and it had gotten in there and scared off all the ones, and it eaten my bat. So I was tracking a snake, basically. So. So does bat biologists drink beer during the day? <laughs> well, I, I I can't because I go I go to work after I go. So I, my my schedule basically is I uh, I wake up around noon, and then I uh, do a lot of prep work, and I eat my dinner early and and that's when I shower and stuff and then I uh, I go out usually around five and then we're out until like three in the morning and then I've got my follow-up paperwork and so I'm up until five or six and then I sleep till noon and repeat repeat and rinse and repeat it's it gets it gets crazy it gets crazy yeah yeah there you go yeah well, thank you yeah again. yeah thank you thank you all